Uh, that's, the, that's the only thing right now, unless anyone has any last minute topics to add today. There is the agenda. All right then. Um, yeah, we have a quick presentation, some demos from Azra on the update framework and stuff like that. Um, do you want to take over screen sharing, Azra, and go from there? Uh, yep. Um, let me see if I can do this. Um, share that. And uh, okay, I think the. Oh, actually, hold on. I'm just gonna. I'm going to reshare this real quick. Sorry about that. Um, all right. Uh, how does that look? Does everyone see the presentation? Yep. All right. Um, so just uh, my name's is Astra, and I work on uh, Dan and Kim's team um, at Google. And basically, this is just a short demo. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, Tough, which is the update framework, and um, how it integrates with uh, Cosign. And so it'll be a pretty quick, um, and hopefully it won't be too confusing, but I'll just jump right in. Um, so what is the update framework? So the update framework, I mean, self-explanatory, is a framework and library for securing update systems. So um, there's plenty of problems and you know as soon as you start doing a little bit of this it starts to roll into larger and larger things of like people trying to distribute software updates um and along that uh, managing how to revoke and add tr trusted keys so uh you know distributing a little bit of software at first might be a little might be okay but after like maybe a month or so how do you make sure that your clients are receiving the correct versions of the software you're trying to distribute um, what happens if you want to update the versions? What happens if you want to update the keys that you trust? Um, what happens if you want to let your clients know that there's been an update? So all of these questions kind of spiral into like more complicated um, scenarios and Tuff tries to provide like a sort of a unified framework that is able to kind of capture these um, threats. And it's also a library and provide general guidance for like how um, you should like sort of secure your update system. Um, so yeah, like I said, there's like a lot of these types of threats like fast forwarding attacks, freeze attacks, um, replay attacks um, that, you know, malware attacks that people can sub in like, you know, malware artifacts and try to get people to trust them. So all these types of attacks are things that the, um, the update framework tries to uh, secure. So um, the basic design principle is kind of on this like separability of roles where um, keys that have a high compromise risk, as in like are more likely to be compromised, online keys, um, things like that, um, are given less responsibility. And then um, keys that are offline and have less risk of being compromised are used for higher level um, designations of trust. Um, and so their roles are a little bit more important. So it tries to balance this out and also separate them so that, for example, if you are expect, if you're uh, delegated to be signing packages, you're not delegated to um, provide clients with, with, with what the latest versions are. Um, and then additionally, there's uh, like sort of a natural threshold level of uh, signatures supported. So you could specify that, you know, you want three out of five um, maintainer keys to be signing um the root trust or you want two out of three of the uh keys responsible for signing packages to attach their signatures to the packages um and then along the way um it also supports naturally updating um trusted keys and revoking them properly so that's kind of just the general idea um it turns into a bunch of formatted stuff later on so just as like a, a high level overview of how it's all structured um, like I said, there was, there's a designation of separate, like role separation, and there's four top level roles. Um, and that first top level role is the root role. And that root role is responsible for delegating which keys are trusted for each of the other roles, including itself. So that root role is really the primary role, which is, um, it, it must be, um, by the tough, like framework offline keys, um, because this has the highest risk of, comp um, like highest like role risk here. If something gets compromised here, it is like kind of game over. Um, and so it's also like worthwhile to put thresholds in here and so on. And so 
this root metadata signs off on all the rest of the roles, including itself, which is why there's this like back arrow into the root, um, this like the smallest dotted line thing signs root keys for. Um, the other three roles are the timestamp role, a snapshot role, and a targets role. So just real quick, the targets role is the thing that's actually signing targets. So signing projects, signing um, packages, signing files you want to distribute, really anything along those lines. Um, then uh, there's two other roles, a timestamp and snapshot. They're kind of similar and they build off of each other. Um, a snapshot role is basically telling you what version of the root and targets are given at a certain time. Um, and then likewise, the timestamp role is telling you, do you have an update? So it's telling you, okay, what was the latest snapshot of the repository? Um, and so generally speaking, the default like um, expiration of each of these roles, like, you know, comes along with how much responsibility they have. So the timestamp role, like in order to like know whether or not you have an update, it's useful to kind of know that on a very, very short um, you know, interval. So maybe every day you receive like a new timestamp saying, hey, this timestamp is updated, go ahead and trust it. So it's like maybe a day's worth of like, okay, a heartbeat, do you have an update or not? All right, good to go. So that'll tell you the version of the snapshot. The snapshot will tell you the version of the targets um, and the targets will tell you what are the targets you're signing. Um, so I kind of just reiterated this. Um, does the sort of basic premise of all of this make sense where you have a delegate like delegated keys for each of these roles of basically like uh, freshness of your artifacts and signatures on the artifact. All right. So how is this all captured? It's captured in a bunch of JSON. Um, so each role has a, a JSON metadata file and each format is something like this where there's a signed portion um, and that'll change depending on the role because each role has a different um, has a different like format of of metadata, so maybe you know the that I'll get into it later. But anyway, each each portion, um, each each role has a specified like signable content, um, and then on top, like parallel to that signable content, is signatures on that signable content. So you'll see a list of signatures specified by their key IDs and a signature that are signing that signed portion. Um, and so then you just distribute this as a whole for each uh, for each role. Um, the root metadata, so this is the, all these are the signable contents. Um, they, it basically like the root one is like most hard to read in my opinion, um, but it basically is specifying what keys um, are authorized for all the top level roots. So you'll basically see a list of keys specified that, hey, this is, you know, the keys that are responsible for signing this repository. And these are the roles that each of them are responsible um, or delegated to. Nothing crazy there. Um, the format's just yeah, it's, it's a little bit like confusing, but after you see it a couple of times, it makes sense. And then along with that, each expert, um, each role has a certain threshold. So what the, what you're seeing over here is that like, you know, maybe for a role timestamp, you'll have a threshold of one, as in one person will need to sign it. Maybe for targets, you'll have two. Um, and each key is specified with maybe a key type, um, some sort of public data associated with it, and then a scheme. Um, so I'll talk about this in future work, but what I think would be really, really cool is if instead of relying on um, public keys and having to manage that in itself, um, it would be really cool to have these be IDs. Um, so OIDC IDs where like you could specify, um, you know, us or at google.com is a target signer. Um, and attached with that, we could add some public um, data that's a full CO cert that's certifying, you know, my existence. <laughs> Um, so that would be some really, really awesome future work and it would like integrate really, really nicely with Sigstore. Um, and then the targets, a little bit simpler here. Um, you see the sign of the signatures at the top and the signable content for targets below. Um, in red, there's the actual target that I'm trying to sign and along with it is a hash um, of it and the length of it. So that's just some like metadata about the file that we're signing. Um, so that one's pretty simple just a list of targets that we want to do. This could be extended. It can also delegate trust to other roles to sign these target meta metadata, but that's a little bit more complicated. We can just think of it like this. Um, and then the snapshot, again, it gives you like a snapshot of what's going on in the targets um, and the root. So what it's doing is it's taking the hash of the actual metadata, which will give you like a verification that yes, these are the artifacts that are, are being distributed at this particular time. Um, this way you can't have these sorts of mix and matches attacks where like you swap out a targets.json and, and keep a different root.json and, and sort of mix and match or like put in some malware in the targets. 
Um, and then along with that same idea as the snapshot, the timestamp is taking a timestamp of the snapshot. So it'll include some metadata about the snapshot. And this kind of builds up this tree of trust. So you, you start at the timestamp to verify, then you verify the snapshot, and then you, you so on and so on. So um, that's kind of how it goes. Um, this timestamp is like very, very short expiration. It's a single day. And this will specify the latest versions. Um, any question on, on this kind of thing? It's maybe so, maybe like it, it's not so, so important, but I guess like the the idea of like protecting against uh, version updates is is the key idea here. Every time you get a timestamp, you know um, what the latest versions are. With, with all these short timestamps, what happens when you know for whatever reason you haven't updated? Uh, probably the biggest problem is what happens if the root doesn't <laughs> and it expires. Yeah, so the root um, is the most critical one here. If there, if you're if you have an expired root and you're not able to obtain a latest version, um, then you're kind of, you know, you can't really trust what you've provided. Um, how it works for like an actual client is that the client needs a single um, initial root. So let's say like, you know, in 2020, I received like a root from SigStore and I'll keep that on hand. And then when I need to download an artifact in 2021, um, SigStore will attach on their artifact um, maybe like a third version of the root metadata and a second version. And I can follow that chain and verify each chain update. So after that, I do that and verify the third version, I can say, okay, I trust the third version. Next time I do an update, I'll just take it from the third. So it kind of builds a chain. You don't need to have like the latest root at every point. You basically need to have a trusted root um, and then you can verify the chain. Um, but yeah, if you, if you don't have, like if the expiration happens, it's expired and you cannot trust it. So it's worth like keeping that in consideration for like the particular use case of like how often can you um, issue these updates. Um, also on that point, it's very useful to have this timestamp key be online. <laughs> and yeah, just like other things is that like generally the root is like about a year of default, um, although you can specify that, like for our own six store route, we're gonna do like four months and have people resign it on a more frequent basis so that we ensure that no one is losing their keys. All right, anything else? All right, so we'll move on. So how does Tough and Cosign work? Um, so, what we can do is we found out like, okay, it would be awesome if you can store like arbitrary artifacts on the registry, why not store some tough metadata? So along with a particular artifact, you could distribute some tough metadata with it. And when a client wants to receive some kind of software, it'll you know download and with an initial route, like I said, um, and verify that the tough metadata on the registry is still valid and verified on that chain from its initial route. Um, so in case there's a registry compromise, you know that you would be able to detect it. In case there was like an update, you'd be able to detect it. Um, and I will show you that in the demo of like an update and saying, okay, well, the targets don't match anymore, reject. Um, additionally, um, let's see. Yeah, we have collaborative signing because this is on a registry. Um, what I can do is when I want to create my tough metadata and um, and sign it, what I can do is I can hold one of the keys like as a maintainer of a particular image and then I can I can sign that and then someone else can you know one of the other maintainers across the world can also end up signing it and we'll both be kind of synchronized on the same registry. So it's it's like kind of true threshold signing where like no one has all the keys at once. Um, and right, like I said, a client needs an initial root. Um, every sequential update, it'll update what it trusts. Um, and then, like I said before, it would be really, really awesome if we had a keyless mode um, where, like, we have cosine keyless, we could instead specify some tough metadata with OIDC IDs um, and simplify a lot of this procedure so that people aren't managing and holding their own keys. All right, any questions before I get into this very quick demo? I, I, I'll bite. Can you briefly explain more about what it would take to get that? Yeah, um, it won't take too long. So like rolling back a little bit on like how this format works. This is the only reason why I put in this like, oh, I shouldn't click on it. Um, the only reason why I put this, uh, you can see my cursor though. 
um, this block over here of key type and key value public. So that's all that's needed to specify a public key. Um, you have a, you know, the, in this case for doing an OIDC ID, we would, you know, have a specified key type of an OIDC ID and our public data associated with that would be the certificate. Um, so that's what I'm thinking. Um, it doesn't seem too hard. And, and the, the benefit of tough is that it's a framework and we can extend from it pretty easily. Um, and clients would essentially verify by checking additionally um, the expiration on the certificate. Yeah, so there's no problem including this additional information if you don't use it, it, it it's signed if you do. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is all part of the, the signed content that the signatures are gonna go over. Um, yeah, it, on top of that, like another extension of this is that we've considered attaching, you know, hardware certs on your HSM key. So instead of just having um, a public key associated with your HSM, you could attach a certificate that the key was on the device and include that in public data here. And so when a client verifies, they additionally check not only the signature on top of this file, but they also go through each key of type, you know, hardware cert or hardware key and check the certs associated with it. All right, anything else? And it's demo time. <laughs> I really hope this is going to work out. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop sharing the presentation now and switch to a different window. Um, all right, is that now? All right, so now you should see a terminal. This is a very proof of concept demo. So. Um, you know, in an ideal case, this would have a lot more verbose logging to tell you what's kind of going on here. Um, but for the sake of what we're doing, it'll work. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call cosine tough init repo. So that'll initialize a tough repository. Um, and I'm going to specify a bunch of public keys to add. Um, again, this doesn't have to happen on someone's single computer here. Um, I'm just doing it for the sake of time. Uh, but I'm going to add them all in one step. So I'm going to add a root public key, a second root public key, and specify a root threshold of two. I'm gonna add a target public key, a timestamp public key. And then because again, for the sake of time, this doesn't have to happen on the same step, I'm, I happen to have both of the keys on my device. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and sign the roots. Um, when I click that, I'm prompted to sign the roots. And what I have here is this verification error that we haven't signed the targets yet. And that's because I did not pass in a target's key yet. I haven't even added a target yet. So I'm going to show you how to do that on this next step right here. So all that was done in this previous step was specify root public, um, specify the top level public keys for each role. Um, I can go ahead and show you um, uploading this. Uh, if I click this and I can show you what I just pushed up. And after this, I will probably skimp a little bit on showing you exactly what's going on because it's it's a lot of metadata. So I, I don't want to show you everything. So basically what I have here is a root.json with two signatures because I passed in two private keys and they're signing the signable content of the root. And the root contains a list of keys right here. Um, and those are the trusted keys for all the top level roles, including you know their, their public data and the scheme type and the key type. Um, and then what I have here is for each role, I have a specified key IDs, which these are the two key IDs I specified for root, a threshold given for them. And for each of the other roles, I have a single key with a threshold of one. So that's kind of what's going on. Everything else is kind of empty right now because I haven't done anything. So what I can do on my next step is actually add a target to sign. So I'm going to do sign and snapshot. Um, this is going to add a target demo image and sign it with my targets key. I'm going to get prompted for a password uh, and I will go ahead and sign that. Again, the final step is I have insufficient signatures for a timestamp key because I never issued a timestamp. So that's my final step here is I'm just going to go ahead and issue a timestamp with my timestamping key. Sign that. And what you should see here now is that everything is done. So the metadata was verified. I currently have a good state of of metadata to go. And so instead of staging it, I've now published it to a well-known .tuff. Um, now, what I have here printed is this is the initial root metadata that we just signed. Um, a client who wants to verify it needs to have an initial one. 
So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pretend I'm the client now. So no longer am I the signer here, but I'm now a client and I'm going to somehow obtain my root.json, which I'm just going to copy and paste into a file here. And so now let's say I wanted to verify the target, which was this like busy box demo over here. Um, so when I do tough verify with my root that I just copied because I just got that somehow, um, I'll verify that. I'll pull the well-known tough. It matches the targets and it in the process of, in the back end of doing this, which I do not have verbose logging. Um, it is verifying all the signatures, verifying the metadata um, and making sure that the target that I retrieved is actually the target that was signed. Um, so now what I want to show you is like, let's say that I tag a different image in here and I push a different one to the busy box demo. Um, and now I try to verify. what I get is an error message saying that the shots don't match. Um, so it's, I think in the end, it's not so complicated. It's <laughs> the metadata formats might be a little bit intimidating, but the rough procedure of it is pretty straightforward um, where, you know, I'm, I'm making sure my timestamp is up to date. I'm making sure my snapshot is up to date. <laughs> I'm making sure my targets files are batching the ones that I want to download. And I'm verifying that the keys are all trusted by my root. So that's kind of the end story of that. And that's the demo. Um, I don't have too many more capabilities of doing updates. I have not tested it properly. <laughs> It'll probably just throw a verification error if I update anything. So, but in, in theory, that's the goal. Any questions, comments, ideas? Oh, um, at the end of my slide, which is linked in the notes, are a bunch of references. So if you want to read more, more about the cosine issues and like the work done on that, um, feel free to click on that slide presentation. I, I hate to be the only person asking questions, but <laughs> I'll just jump in. <laughs> so, um, so on the one hand, hooray! I'm I, whoops. What happened to you? <laughs> she disappeared. <laughs> There oh my! <laughs> she heard I was asking a question and left immediately. Probably wise on her part. I was like, no. <laughs> Sorry about that. Go ahead. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't want this to sound ungrateful because I'm I'm actually excited about the, the the progress here. But you know, they when you kind of walk through um, on the, the 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 root side side and so on. Um, Boy, those were all, there were a lot of options in there. And I understand this is early stuff, but I think one of the challenges for all this stuff has been, well, I mean, technically there's, we've been able to sign things and then verify signatures for decades. Uh, the problem is the hideous effort of doing it and make, memorizing all the numbers and some, you know, memorizing all these options and trying to find ways to get the data distributed in an easier way. So uh, I realize a lot of that is an artifact of, hey, I just got it working. Um, but at least I think that's the reason. So can you convince me that this is just an artifact of we're just starting and here's how it, it could be greatly simplified, acknowledging that there's probably other ways to simplify it. But, but oh, yeah. how do you see it being simplified to something you know, Joe user who doesn't, or, you know, who doesn't really care <laughs> about signing, yep. they just want it out. <laughs> yeah, no, th this is something that I, I hesitated about, about the demo, because it was like, oh my God, there's so many command line arguments. How are we going to make people want to use this? Right. Um, so there, there's a handful of things and it's, yeah, it's kind of an artifact of me doing this as a proof of concept. Um, the first thing is that like, for some of the low risk keys, we can have cosine generate them or do a keyless mode for them. So people won't even have to think about um, generating and creating their own timestamping keys. Um, the second part is that uh, actually the way that Tuff does, uh, like the Tuff implementations in Python do it, is that instead of people passing in their arguments, they kind of just expect a directory structure where all their keys are held, public data of the keys are held, um, and then it builds it automatically off of that. And I've considered that, but I don't like that really from a usability perspective. Um, and I think that like the the main the main advantage I see here is that supporting keyless mode will go will like you know bring us from like you know um unintelligible garbage on the command line to like actually usable it'll like probably remove like 90 percent of those command line arguments 
Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, frankly, I'm, I'm much more worried that there is a story than which story. If that if that if that makes any sense. Although I, I mean, I do care that it, that it be easy enough and applicable everywhere and so on. But I think that's really the key. Is uh, pun not intended? Um, is how do we make it so that it's so simple that you know why are you not doing this? This is yeah. right. Yeah, I, I the the real key is here that we yeah exactly have a. a keyless mode where people don't have to manage their own keys in doing this process. Um, so everything happens behind the scenes already. Like, you know, there's no verbose logging here. You don't have to really toy with this metadata um, visually. Um, all you'll have to do is, you know, uh, click the OIDC flow um, to timestamp and update and everything. So maybe to put brass tacks on, how long do you think it'll be from where you are to the point where it's, wow, oh. it's, yeah, that, it's, that's so, it's so easy a monkey can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't. I, the the enhancement to doing OIDC IDs is not the challenging part. Um, the challenging part is making sure this update system is properly working um, and that like all the attacks are are full. Changing it over to keyless mode is like not that bad at all. Okay, how about for both then? Okay, for total. I'm trying to get a bit, uh, better idea of where we are. Yeah, yeah. For total, I think like the the keyless mode is honestly like another sort of like you know hackish like you know. A week, I I could probably finish it up um, and make sure it's swappable and integratable with like security keys, um, your own supply public keys, and a keyless mode. Um, for making sure everything is working properly, I would say that's it's less than a quarter of work, um, but it's probably nearing that inch point of of a quarter. Okay, quarter of a year. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Others. On the, on the ease of use thing, um, I was just going to say, I think we can come up with good, correct defaults for pretty much everything, except for maybe like how many keys you want to have. Um, you kind of have to pick that yourself. If there's only one of you, it wouldn't make sense to you know set up 17. Uh, but if you have like five people, then it would make sense for all of them. Um, so like one of the groups we've been talking to the most about this is the Kubernetes release engineering team, where they want to distribute them among a wide group of people. And so just like kind of one knob there of how many people do you want to be involved in signing this? Uh, what do you want the quorum to be? Yeah, we could just say one more than majority. That's fine for most things. And then how often do you want to have to do stuff? So how many people? And then how often do you want to have to refresh this stuff? Those are kind of the two dimensions of not even just security. It kind of ties into how often the product does releases and stuff like that. Yeah, and I don't see a crisis in, you know, if you don't specify, say, you know, a quick interaction of, you know, what do you want? Here's the default. What do you want? Here's the default. Right. It's okay. just, it just has to be painfully easy because that's always been the problem. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Like, as, as, if you see those command line arguments, there's no way you're going to want to use it right now. Like, this is like only for me. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I, I don't object to command line arguments in principle. It's just the, uh, we, we need to make that the not normal case. <laughs> Um, I may be oversimplifying, but just trying to sort of wrap my head around the intuition of what Tuff is bringing here, um, maybe just confirm that I'm understanding this correctly, I guess. It seems like two things. One is the threshold mechanism. So instead of like one key or one person signing a thing, you, you can set a policy that says like n of m right and the second is like the manifests and the chaining for uh like i guess rotation of credentials but also uh like cosign can tell you is this artifact that i'm looking at legitimate but with Tuff, it, it can also tell you if it's the latest correct artifact that you should be installing. So somebody couldn't say trick you into installing an old version with a known compromise in it or something like that. Is that correct? And am I missing anything? Yep, those are both right on on, on those two parts. And then there's like, a, I think a, a bit more emphasis on like the key revocation and addition story um, is that it provides this way of like independently deciding to update which keys can sign targets or which keys can be revoked there and which ones are providing timestamps and which ones aren't. So it provides like a hierarchy of this key, key like management so that, 
you know, lower level keys can be swapped out easily. There's like 37 other things it does too, but those are two of the biggest ones. Thank you. One of my favorites that people, nobody remembers, but uh, the tough people remind me of every single time is uh, what you described is called a freeze attack. Like if somebody tricks you into installing an old version, that's an attack, even though it's a correctly signed and authentic old version. Um, the other one is a fast forward attack where somebody can trick you into installing version 1 million. Um, then you end up getting pinned on that and no new ones you know, published between now and 1 million or something like that. Would, would So it's like a way to force people to do freeze attacks. And so it handles all of these things in complicated, elegant ways. Oh, I just wanted to mention this, uh, this other point that I thought of that for some reason just didn't come to mind when I was answering David's question. But um, on terms of usability, another thing that we've been looking at um, is just completely removing the timestamp and snapshot rule in favor of access to the transparency log. So the transparency log instead would provide you with like um, a way of verifying what's the latest thing um, by nature of it being like a transparency log. Um, and so then in that sense, you would much, much greatly simplify what's going on here. Um, so that's another thing that, that we've been thinking of in terms of simplifying. Also, uh, that's not just a simplification. That's actually a pretty big security improvement. And the closest thing to what Oz are just demoed is Docker Content Trust, um, which works this way. It uses the update framework for signing Docker containers using a system called Notary v1. Um, there are a couple issues with it. Um, it never really got much adoption. Uh, the biggest issue is the the root kind of policy that Oz just showed. All of this requires chaining back to that initial root. Um, and in CI systems and things like this, where you want to be mostly verifying this stuff, uh, trust on first use becomes trust on every use because you have no way to remember the root in between previous invocations. Um, so it kind of takes away all of the benefits if you're downloading the root in a fresh GitHub action every time you're going and verifying against that root. Uh, so the transparency log also gives a way to mitigate trust on first use by making it to trust on global first use instead of trust on every first use. Ooh, you know, that's a really important point. I don't know if anybody, has that been documented anywhere that people could find? Other than right here in this call? <laughs> um, uh, I didn't make it up. Uh, I don't know where I got it. I think it might've been from the Go module transparency design docs explaining how they did version pinning in Go modules. Um, this basic tactic of caching, caching hashes locally stops working in CI systems because the cache is reset every single time. Yeah. It's not so much that. I think that's known. It's the, hey, wait a minute. If you have this global, right. then th th that it, it's the compensating that's new. Right. And yeah, that's why the Go, yeah, Go modules and the Go program and it's built their transparency log to mitigate that problem. Okay. I wonder if that should be something noted by the SIG store folks or something somewhere. I see, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be useful. And I think like on future iterations of our like six store root key signing, we, we should really move it to the, uh, you know, remove those timestamp and snapshot rules and have everyone be verifying on the transparency log. Um, but there's there's definitely a little bit of work there to to make that happen properly. All right, I mean, if there's no more questions, I think that that's kind of all I had. Awesome. Thanks for the demos. Yes, thank you. Uh, d d doing demos is always a risk, so <laughs> good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to know how uh, how late into this I was working on it, tweaking things. So <laughs> uh, the the demo gods were kind. Anyone else want to do an off the cuff demo? <laughs> No. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else, Dan? You want to end early? Yeah, we can end. Cool. All right. See you, everybody. Thanks, Azra. <laughs> yeah.